So Ed, welcome to Expo North Digital. So you were an alum of Expo North, which yes. is very exciting. You were there during the festival and now you are participating in the virtual festival <laughs> that we're having during I love lockdown. It. Yeah. Um, so really welcome, Ed. I'm so happy to be able to chat with you. Will you explain to our audience, our virtual audience, who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So it's great to work with you again, Jessica. And I loved uh, Expo North and, and being uh, with you in Scotland. It was uh, one of the highlights was, of my life. That was awesome. Same. Um, so uh, who am I? Ed Hoffman. Uh, what I'm probably most known for is I spent most of my career at NASA, uh, a little over 30 years at NASA. Uh, I got there at a strange time where uh, we had the Challenger uh, disaster, a loss of seven lives. And for reasons I won't go into, they asked me to establish a uh, NASA Academy for how do people learn? How do they work effectively in teams? How do you help an organization uh, uh, increase the likelihood of success? And I was also NASA's first uh, chief knowledge officer, uh, which was the last thing I did for, the, for about six years. And then I left NASA in 2016 and uh, really I predominantly consult to organizations and leaders that are project-based, working freelance, working with pressures on cost and time, and typically trying to create something, something that's unusual and special. And I teach at Columbia University uh, around uh, knowledge, knowledge and leadership. Uh, Ed, that's fantastic. And for the layman, can you explain, because it sounds pretty much like the coolest title that has ever existed, what a chief knowledge officer does for NASA? It is the coolest title. I've been, I was in China once and I saw an uh, ambassador to, uh, to the United States, to China, and uh, she got all excited. She says, I love your title. And then I realized how valuable that title was. Uh, a chief knowledge officer to me is basically someone who's concerned with the team or an organization or society from the standpoint of how they're learning, how they collaborate together how they identify important knowledge and expertise and share it amongst themselves. So when they need to make the right decision, they, they have the community and they have the resources to, to do that, to be successful. That's fantastic. And you have a background in psychology, is that yes. right? And can you explain a little bit to people too about maybe your unique perspective that you offered project management teams and NASA itself? Yeah, so I got, I mean, it was interesting because I tried to heat, keep that hidden a little bit. When I got to NASA, uh, my background is I was getting my doctorate from Columbia University in uh, organizational psychology. How do people work well together? And um, I got into NASA, and particularly when they, they had me set up this uh, project management initiative, I originally turned it down because I said, I don't know anything about engineering, and I don't know anything about projects. I'm a, you know, and then they put me into it. Uh, because of the importance of learning and the importance of being able to work and manage change. That was their, their kind of thinking, which turned out to be right. Um, but the psychology part was something in the early years at NASA, I kind of, you know, you stay away from what you probably most believe in because you think it doesn't matter as much to others. And uh, when I started finding out in my experience at NASA, this, this tech organization, really this uh, great uh, great projects, people see it as a Spock-like organization. And really it's all about people. And I, I got to the point where I tell the folks is if we get the human part right, the human element right, that everything else we can handle. And uh, you could look at uh, really the failure reports, all the failures big and small. And at the core, it's how do we work together as people? So uh, on my LinkedIn, it's people, people, people. It starts <laughs> with the human element. If you don't get that right, uh, it's really hard to be successful. If you get it right, you can do anything. You know, that's a really salient point, especially for now, where everyone is distributed and trying to work from home in teams. So we're all self-isolated, but within teams. So do you think some of the principles that you've developed over the years working with NASA and now with Columbia and PMI, do you think they still apply to a digital way of working. Oh yeah, and no, I think it's even more important now. Um, so one of the reasons uh, for leaving NASA is I always wanted to see is what were I in, you know, in this strange bubble where NASA is different, it's unique, it's got, you know, people used to, to learning. Uh, maybe what I was seeing was there, but working with the Project Management Institute, uh, I support about 90 different organizations around the world. 
uh, in all different areas. Uh, and uh, in Colombia, it's the same. The students come from all different walks of life. And uh, again, it's reinforced. We start with the people. We, we want to look at the tool. We want to have a method. We want to get AI or something that's going to solve everything. But if you don't understand what people value, if people don't have a voice, a place where we can talk and disagree and argue, then it goes wrong. So it, it, it's so I'm even more certain of that now than ever before. That's all, that's awesome to hear. And I am so sorry to do this to you because you are a people person. But Ed, yeah. I am going to stick you on a desert island. I am taking inspiration from desert island discs, but we're shifting to film because you and I are cinephiles. Um, so Absolutely. in terms of what you can teach us about um, project management, community, people, psychology, leadership, that kind of thing. We're gonna look at three of your films. I'm giving you three on this desert island um, and see if there's any links between the stories and the characters and the love of film for some of the lessons that you've learned along the way. So if you were to only have three films to watch over and over again on the desert island, what would the first one be? Yeah, and that would be tough because you know we've talked about this for a long, long time. And I always come up with lists about a hundred. Yeah, I, um, I you know, so my favorite recent one of the last number of years is Interstellar. Yeah. And um, so first of all, I realized one of the things why I love about film and TV is I'm a visual person. You know, the different people learn different ways. I like seeing things. And I do love uh, films that have a beauty about them. Mm. Uh, you know, some people like, um, I guess, you know, things that make you think. Some people like the music, and, and that's all, all, all great, but I love a story that's about the images. That's why I like art museums. Yeah. Uh, you know, from the time I was young, I liked looking at an artwork because it pulled me in. Uh, the power of story to me connects. And so one of the things when I watched Interstellar, I was just blown away. Uh, I thought it was beautiful. I mean, it starts off in a very, uh, in, a, in a disaster. You know, uh, the crops aren't growing, so you get the farm, you have the dust, you can actually smell it. Uh, when I watched that movie at the beginning, it's oh, yeah. having trouble, you know, with the, my sinuses. <laughs> and then it takes you to all these different places in terms of, you know, loops and, and holes and space and duration. And uh, it always annoyed me because when I speak to friends, that's not one of the movies anybody ever picks. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, I've heard a lot of people complain about it because it doesn't make sense, they say. Mm -hmm. And yet coming from NASA, and particularly with my psychology background, most of the stuff didn't make sense. Uh, I love the engineers probably more than they did because to this day, I don't know why a plane flies. <laughs> I cannot figure it. So I always thought part of NASA and engineering and modern science is magical. There's a magic to it. And I think that kind of part of me really appeals to it. So with Interstellar, what I think it, it talks about, you know, first of all, it's about love. You know, it's about, uh, you know, family. Yeah. It's about the, the father who goes away to take on this mission, work-oriented, typical male, and then leaves the children. And there's repercussions there and the resolution. So it's, I think, uh, one, it's about people. Uh, there's a strong love message there. I think another thing about Interstellar is the danger of a society getting angry at science and learning. Uh, it's a very scary uh, and, and too apropos nowadays focus on when people just turn away from knowledge mm. and science and expertise in any, any field. Have you, and have that's you come, a lesson there. Have you come across that when you tell people that you work for NASA? Have, have you come across that kind of pushback? You know, NASA, I think beauty, uh, and I don't think even NASA realizes that it's not around the science or the technology or the things. It's around the humanity. It's about the love. Mm -hmm. Because I've gone all over the world and I have people who are from different countries who thank me for the fact that I'm part of NASA. Because it's a community thing, it's a love thing, it's a special thing, you know, it's, uh, there's something, yeah. So it's not about the, look, the science and the technology, they're vital, they're the tools, right? It's like saying, you know, you love film because of the people, but not the story, but it's all, it's there, right? So, but NASA is so special because it's one of the few things I think the world has 
where we can come together and we can appreciate each other and love what we're about. So I think it's the inspiration that makes NASA special. And I think they have a problem when we would try to sell it on numbers and on, uh, you know, people don't, you know, so yeah. So I think it's the humanity that pulls it together. Do you know, I love that um, a lot, Ed, because it shows the kind of big punchline for me then from Interstellar, one of your choices is that it's really about the humanity. So yeah. even if you're involved in any kind of technical enterprise, it's really, if you want something that resonates, it's about the humanity behind it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it starts with the people. And I also think, I mean, I'm a, uh, like yourself, I think we connect around story. Yeah. And, and certainly film and all that. But I really feel that the greatest changes that happened to NASA during my time there, this is now, now decades, is uh, the changes happened through story. Mm. So. You know, I always would tell my folks, I'm not a training person. You know, training is for animals, training is for dogs, but I'm about learning and development and conversation. And when you say to someone, tell me your story, you can say anything. There's not a right story and a wrong story. And it invites discussion and different opinions. And uh, so a lot of the learning we did at NASA was around stories and around people talking about successes and failures and where do we go with this? So I think it, that's also the connection to, uh, you know, to Interstellar and, and all these. And, and just the notion of you, you don't give up, right? And, uh, but, I, but I do love the fact, it's probably a reaction to people telling me they don't like the movie, that it makes you stronger. But, but I, the, the criticism is what's happening. It's kind of like Westworld. Yeah. People yeah. say, we don't know. <laughs> well, that's the world. We don't, who knows what's going on now? You know, I mean, uh, so, uh, and my experiences again at NASA and at Columbia and at PMI is that the biggest challenge is you get people who have the passion, they have a smarts, they have a commitment, they work something, but they know that they don't know the answers. So you're searching and finding. And when you get that moment and you have that in the film, there's moments where, wow, this, this is there. There's the connection. There's that beauty uh, of what life is about, I think. So I'm, I'm probably overblowing it, but no, I, think I love it. I look, a I spiritual movie. I totally agree with you. I absolutely adore Interstellar as well. And you hit upon something, even at the very beginning, about how important images are when it comes to storytelling and making them emotionally resonate. So two of my favorite storytellers I can think of agree with you. So Joseph Campbell was always fascinated. He had a book called The Mythic Image, and he was fascinated by how an image can cause a thrill in the mind. Um, and that really led him down the path of studying folklore and mythology. Um, which is so image heavy. I mean, it's all, it's all about the images it creates. And then um, uh, J.O. Callahan, the storyteller, you know him, you're a good friend, um, but the audience might not. He's a wonderful storyteller. And he always, his advice to people who are crafting stories, no matter what medium you're working with, is let the image tell the story. So you just trust in the images and follow them. So Ed, you're, I feel like you're spot on. And that, that, the interstellar is a great place to begin. Yeah. So, I love your first choice. So moving quickly on to your second, what is, what's the second movie you're taking with you to that desert island? So the second movie is darker, but you know, I like kind of the dark. I think it's, uh, it, it, you know, predicts kind of what you got to worry about. Second one would be Minority Report. God, that's an interesting one. It is dark. Yeah. Tell um, me why. So, so for you know, I love Spielberg. So I have to have at least one. Um, <laughs> I love a lot of his. I also was thinking about AI, but, but I think Minority Report is uh, almost, you know, it's like a perfect film to me in that it has incredibly strong messages. It's a harsh movie in a way that it needs to be, uh, but there's that, that hope in it. So one of the things when I work with organizations, uh, it's, you know, Amy Edmondson, uh, the Harvard, uh, you, know, uh, you know, scholar, basically says the most important thing for a group of people or for an organization or society to have to be successful is psychological safety, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Psychological safety is nothing more than we can talk about anything. We can say anything to each other and it's okay. And it's okay to argue, it's okay to disagree, but we have to be comfortable with each other to talk about things. And Minority Report uh, is, a, is a place, it's a time, it's a scary uh, world where uh, it's unsafe to, to say things yeah. uh, in a lot of ways. You, you can't challenge the power 
right? And uh, so you get into this bizarre situation where you can predict crimes and you can stop the crimes, but you still, uh, you, you imprison people for what they might have done. And uh, if you can stop it, then what's going on there? But I think it's, a, it's again, it's, it's so overly heavy in terms of where, where we get into trouble, where you have too much power that's localized mm -hmm. uh, in a political entity, where they couple that with a sense of knowing what's right for everyone else, and where science and technology is used to uh, limit freedom. Yes, that's right. And um, so it's um, it's still a be it's a beautifully uh, you know visual movie. So mm -hmm. I love that. It it's very um, it's got really strong characters and uh, and and leads. And there's there's a dy dynamism. And from a storytelling, you got the big problem. How do you deal with this? But to me, I think it's the philosophical issue that we all deal with, which is, you know, how are we honest with each other and how do we collaborate effectively together? That's to me is what I, I always go back to Minority Report uh, with a mixture of, oh my God, can we ever get this stuff right? Totally. And I think that's a huge, a huge, one, a huge lesson for the second one too, because that psychological safety comes along with not only good rapport and good collaboration, but also getting the best out of someone. Your imagination should be a place where you're thinking about all these possibilities in safety. Yeah. And so to limit that potential, even the dark potential, people have a freedom to their own internal world, right. is, is really damaging to a whole host of um, places that require innovation. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think that's the key. I mean, so NASA is a place that it, to survive, it has to have creative creativity, right? It's got to have innovation. And you can get it from NASA. You can get it from your industry partners, right? Whether it's a Boeing or a SpaceX or, you know, any of the organizations that work with them. Um, or you can get it from international partners, right? All the, But you have to have the ability for creativity to happen. And, and in my experience, innovation only happens when you have freedom for people to have permission to say what's on their mind and to to sometimes provoke and create a, a different reaction. And then you have to have resources that support yeah. uh, these ideas. And so in Minority Report, they have all these resources, but it's basically used to, uh, to, to quiet us. Yeah. And uh, the outcomes are, uh, they're hideous. They're, uh, they're, what an awful society. It's a real, that's a real, that's a very powerful second one. So we have the first choice in terms of interstellar, we have kind of for the love of it and humanity, kind of that drive, that how important that is as a driving force. And the second one almost is a warning tale where, right. yeah, you have the importance of psychological safety for a whole host of things, whether it's team building and innovation and the growth of, and how resources are used. So that's, that's huge. Also, both these movies have fantastic world building. So someone's yeah. really thought about that world and what it would look like, smell like, t all those, it was so, all these things are crafted with such love. I mean, I, oh, it's I, amazing. I, yeah, I, no, it, 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 it's, uh, you know, I mean, the film of the last hundred years is our artwork, you yes. know, so when you look at uh, the 1600s and 1700s, you, you go to a museum and you see incredible uh, masterpieces. And for me, at least they connect because they connect to a story, yeah. probably just my story, but Maybe it's not what the artist expected, but it creates a story. And uh, we're living in an age of the visual image in terms of uh, movie and TV and, and all that. And that, that's the modern art. But those are, I think, two movies that are just, they're artworks. People will want to watch them forever. And they connect with you and make you feel. That's right. And it's a miracle they're so beautiful. There's so many moving facets to making a yeah. movie that these are movies where someone's vision really came together. Right. So for your for your third movie, I really hope it's more uplifting because you're going to be stuck on this <laughs> yeah. stuck on this uh, desert island. Um, so okay, what is what is the third one? Young Frankenstein. Ah oh, yes, <laughs> love, <that. laughs> love Young Frankenstein. Um, yeah, so at the core of everything, um, I like to laugh. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked together at NASA uh, a while back. Uh, I love the team because I thought we could laugh together. We had fun. We celebrated. Uh, I think laughter is really vital yeah. uh, because, you know, when I would, I would see people just starting at NASA their first day, they're thrilled. 
and their their parents are thrilled and call and everything's great. And I tell them, you got to hold this feeling while you love it right now, because you're going to go through tough times. doesn't matter where you work. You're going to have good days. You're going to have people you hate working with. You're going to have issues that come up and we have to turn back to what it is that, you know, that gives us pleasure. And I think comedy laughter is that. And, uh, to me, the other thing, you know, there's a few things about Young Frankenstein. I had to pick a Mel Brooks movie because yeah. I love Mel. And, and I wanted something that was funny because I think funny is essential. Uh, if you don't have funny, you end up in Minority Report uh, or you end up not appreciating science, right? You can't laugh. And um, Young Frankenstein, though, one of the things I've always said is I want to work with people that I like. And uh, different people have different reactions to that. You know, well, is it productivity? Is it... I think you're most productive when you're with people that you enjoy. There's a kind of, and the cast that they have on Young Frankenstein, man, I would love to be with them. You know, I mean, you, you think of Mel Brooks and Marty Feldman and Clarus Leachman and Terry. I mean, you go through the whole list. It's like, wow. Madeline Kahn. This is, Madeline Kahn. Yeah. yeah, I get the, the only thing that depresses me about Young Frankenstein is I can't be with these people. <laughs> I know. Right? So um, it's kind of, I mean, this goes in a totally different direction. It's kind of what I, I consider the Gilligan's Island effect. Because yeah. I've heard people, you know, they hate that show and it's awful. And how is it so, so why do people watch it? I think it's, it's a clear answer is that the people that they casted, you have to like, you know, those people on that show. So you're getting together with people that you enjoy. And uh, coming back to Young Frankenstein, it's the, the importance of having a cast uh, having coworkers, having a family that you really, really enjoy and you have fun with. More than love, it's the ability to like somebody, right? Because again, you go through good times, bad times, you laugh together. So Young Frankenstein does that. And on the more serious note, I think uh, from a directoral standpoint, they made this, a decision to do that in black and white. And, you know, when I think about that, I grew up in a generation of color. So who would do a movie in black and white? But to me, there was learning from the history that those old universal movies that I love, the, the original Frankenstein, they have this gothic, you know, shades and colors and you, you, you know about this better than I do. And they reproduce that. So that young Frankenstein looks like Frankenstein with a bunch of crazy, goofy people. You could, it's real, you believe in it. <laughs> So I love it. And the fact that the monster, you know, is again, the hero. Mm -hmm. So it's not what you see, it's who you are, but just, uh, and, but mainly cause I'd be laughing whenever if I'm down, if I watch young Frankenstein, everything changes. It's the, ab the Abbey normal. Is Abbey normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's you, right. Abbey you, normal. You yeah. you've said, Igor. Yeah. Igor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Frankenstein is also. Yeah. The, right. The, yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. But do you, do you know, you have such a good antennae. You have a really good, very sensitive emotional antennae because the two things you mentioned there about just, it looks like so much fun to be with those people. You really want to like the people that you're on your ship with um, through the good seas and the bad seas. And then also the, how beautiful it was that they had a lot of integrity about the visuals of the movie. Both those things are true. You know, if you watch the X, because I'm a big nerd for these things, if you watch the behind the scenes, they had a great time. Like they had such a good yeah. time. It was really difficult for them to finish some of the scenes because they were laughing I so hard. I've seen the extras on the, because uh, I get the big editions of all these things that well, I like. Did, did you hear with. the story about how he got away with making it black and white? No, I don't remember that. I, this, I, yeah. this is actually a good lesson for any filmmaker or anyone who really wants to do something different and believes in their vision. So he, he was already quite famous at the time of making Young Frankenstein and he walked into their office and made this amazing pitch and they're like, oh no, that, you know, this sounds great. And he said that he knew it was going to be a problem. And at the very, very end of the meeting, he was almost leaving the door and he popped his head back in. He's like, by the way, it's in black and white and runs down the hall. And he said that he could hear this herd of really distressed right. producers running after him. Um, and they continually tried to convince him not to do it, that it yeah. would sell abroad. And he stuck to his guns and very glad he did. Yeah, no, that perseverance, that, that's in common of all, uh, I think all uh, ultimate successes is you're seeing something that others don't see. And organizations and people tend to be, they're risk averse, right? 
let's not take the road. But, but the things that really matter, the things that change things and change society are things that are risky, that are unknown, creative. And they have to have people who basically fight for it. But yeah, no, brilliant, uh, brilliant choice, brilliant movie. Yeah. And these are brilliant choices. I applaud your three movies on your desert right. island. And that means a lot coming from you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I really do. I think they're... I've got another I, list, as you know, of about 20 others on there. So. <laughs> it was hard. I think for, for me, it would be either Mel Brooks or Marx Brothers, because I yeah. just like the anarchy that the Marx Brothers bring to remind us. Oh, the Marx Brothers, yeah. I was actually thinking of the Marx Brothers. Um, yeah, I guess it, for me, I went in the Young Frankenstein also because with Mel Brooks, I think of Blazing Saddles and you know, as above everything else he did. With the Marx Brothers, they had so many that are at that kind of uh, that chaos. Yeah. But I totally agree with you. I love it. <laughs> it is happy chaos. The Marx yeah. Brothers, I really, really love it. Ed, thank you so much for joining us for the Digital Entrepreneur and Turn sharing your weekly results. series. I would love that. We should, we should def, I'd be happy to talk about talking. movies. Yeah, um, but, um, well, I look forward to part two. Absolutely. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah.